Portugal tem um plano de ação e tem trabalho consistente na área da mutilação genital feminina, isso deve-se sobretudo a um grupo de mulheres, algumas das quais estão nesta sala. Eu quero pedir-vos muito sinceramente uma grande salva de palmas para a Ilse Leis, para a Conform Homo e para a Ho Ho. Porque foi com elas, foi com elas... Foi com elas que começou todo o processo. O primeiro programa de ação para o fim da mutilação genital feminina que Portugal teve e que tem agora, vai creio, no terceiro, deveu-se a um projeto Daphne que tinha como coordenadora a Ho Ho e também a Ilse Leis o trabalho na área da formação de profissionais de saúde. Começou em Portugal através da experiência e da reflexão que todas aprendemos na altura com a, com a Confor. Portanto, nós temos nesta sala as mulheres que foram responsáveis por todo este processo. Quem se associou posteriormente a Fatumata de Jao Baldé, do Comitê Nacional da Guiné-Bissau, são este grupo de mulheres que fizeram e continuam a fazer a diferença, não apenas em Portugal, mas em muitos países. É curioso, nós já não nos víamos desde 2007, possivelmente, e é curioso que ao fim destes 10 anos, quando analisamos os percursos, percebemos que todas crescemos, fomos mudando abordagens, mas continuamos no mesmo barco. Continuamos no mesmo barco porque são, não é uma questão apenas de causa. É uma questão que foi falada ontem aqui, quando falamos de direitos humanos, não é apenas uma expressão bonita, é algo que se tem que materializar no dia-a-dia -dia das pessoas, no dia-a-dia -dia destas mulheres. E como eu gosto de dizer não é uma expressão minha, mas uma expressão antiga, com as mulheres, tudo. Sem as mulheres, nada. Ok. Uh, good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. After 17 years working in different settings about FGM, with some of the strong voices and experts in this seminar, it's a great honor to be here today moderating this important roundtable about institutional response in health. Important because all the necessary and coherent responses we request to all government, civil society organizations, professionals and public voices that announce investments and promotion of girls' and women's rights without leaving no one behind. With these experts and at the same time strong voices working together from different re re regions, we will be able to change the daily life and the future of girls and women with FGM or at risk of GEM. This roundtable aims to highlight some uh, results and initiatives by countries with the civil society and academic with a view to consider their implications or further to strengthen or follow up. We know that many countries are facing the challenge of FGM as part of all forms of gender-based violence, but at the same time are taking measures to ensure that women everywhere can realize, can realize their own potential and rights with dignity and respect according to health and rights standards. This seminar is a project uh, and project are good examples of the kind of conversations we need to have in order to realize women and girls' rights, as well as other national, regional and global agreements. Ensure that no one is left behind and recognizing that we are all critical actors for sustainable development and women, uh, human rights to health, education, justice, participation, political and economic, and economic settings. On, we could go on, but uh, we have short time. I want to make sure to give lots of time to our experts 
and you, the audience today. Let me find the second one. Um, and now I would like to start this roundtable with Comfort Momo. Comfort, we know that um, you, as men, as many examples to share on different approach to address the challenge of health services and care, namely women's rights to health of women and girls with FGM. Can you tell us what you consider the main highlights to operationalize the concept of the institutional response? Dear Comfort, the floor is yours. Okay, I have a presentation. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. My plan was to stand here, doesn't look like I am going to. Great. Can you all hear me? Yes. Right. Good afternoon. Okay, it's still morning. Good morning. Um, I'll just like to say a big thank you for the organizers for inviting uh, me um, to this event. It's been really interesting. Um, the, the, yesterday was fascinating for me to hear from different um, um, places and to see what um, people are doing in their different countries and also what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes that I have is to give you an idea what we're doing in the UK and um, from hearing people yesterday and this morning it's really reassuring to see that we within Europe we are leading in UK uh, and you will see why I say that so this is me as you can see, I've got a reason for putting um, a proud midwife there because my background is mid midwifery and nursing. So that's me. And that's what I'll be talking about. That's me again. I call this the queen and I. I always put, <laughs> I always put these on my... Um, presentation because I truly dedicate all the work I've done around FGM, all the work I've done around human rights and supporting women and girls to women and girls out there. So this is truly dedicating this to women and girls and also to my colleagues as well. I've met the Queen twice now and she knows all about FGM, trust me. <laughs> right, so... This is very important. These are some of the measures that we've taken in the UK. In 2014, we had the first um, FGM summit, looking at FGM, looking at other um, harmful traditional practices, as well as looking at um, domestic violence, violence against women, looking at trafficking, looking at forced marriages, and so on. And as you can see here, the main measure, we now have what we call mandatory recording and we have mandatory reporting, which is really confusing at the moment for all professionals because mandatory recording, somebody mentioned yesterday what you're doing here in Portugal as well, where you make sure when you are, um, as health, health professionals, when somebody discloses FGM to you, you record the type, um, when they had the FGM perform, their consequences or the help that they need. So we're doing that. That is mandatory recording. But mandatory reporting, like I said, is creating lots of issues at the moment because in the UK since 2015, we have to report to the police all children under 18 
for example, as a midwife, if I have a 14-year-old or 15-year-old that come to me and say, comfort, I'm having problem with my period, and this is related to my FGM, I have to call the police. Initially, when this first started, I had lots of reservation because for me, it's like you, you're penalizing the, the, the children or you're punishing them all over again. But again, I would like to hear your views around this. But that is what we're now doing, unfortunately. When we have a disclosure on that 18, we have to call 101, which is the police, report to the police, and then the police will take more details and then they investigate. And the reason why we've come up with this or why the um, CPS, the prosecution um, department, and the police have come up with this is because they feel really shameful that since 1985, when we have the first... Um, the first law against FGM, we've never had any prosecution. Again, do you want to ask whether is it about prosecuting the family or is it about raising awareness? Is it about reaching out to the community? Is it about supporting and empowering the girls and the community to change their attitude and mindset? So again, it's something for us to really look at. And you can see we now have a long life victim and not, I can never pronounce this, anonymity, um, extension of extraterritorial impact. Because with the first law we had, which is the 1985s, it makes it illegal to circumcise or to FGM girls in the UK, as you all know. Then in 2000, I was one of the expert witnesses to change the law, and they changed the law. Now we have... Um, it brought three changes. It brought the extraterritorial impact, meaning as a UK resident, UK nationals, if you take your child back home, you are liable. So we have now. And then we now have the Serious Crime Act, which is, again, a very good tool to use. And this is very important, the FGM um, protection order which can be used by anybody. You might have a neighbor that you feel that your neighbor's daughter is at risk of FGM, you can use this protection order. I can't go into details because of time but it's just to quickly give you <coughs> an idea what we have um, in the UK. Again, this is stretching on on the um, protection order. Yeah. And it's similar to the one that was um, developed in 2010 for um, first marriage, yeah? So again, you can quickly read that. Right, this is very important. These are the latest figures. Um, now that we started collecting data, um, now that we started looking at um, the mandatory recording, we now have lots of statistics. We now have lots of information in terms of how many women and girls are we talking about. For me, this is very important. Yes, in the past, we have... Um, um, organization like Forward, you all know Forward, they're one of the leading organizations in the UK that supports F um, that um, work around FGM and they collaborated with City University to do pre um, prevail um, prevalence um, studies and they did two different studies. Their studies was good, it gave us a, a guesstimate of what we're talking about but these now that doctors, nurses, midwives, health visitors started recording, we now have a much, much robust data. And for me, this robust data will help in future in terms of commissioning services for, um, for uh, survivors or victims of FGM. So again, I can't go much into details, but I have... Um, website link that you can always go into to give you uh, more information but this is as you can see the NHS digital statistic this is from when we started collecting the data it shows that this number have attended some form of um, clinics or attended GP general practitioner and was identified so again, this is really significant in terms of giving us a true figure rather than estimate. 
And as you can see here, this is an average of one appointment every 61 minutes, which is very significant here. Yeah? I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> so again, that figure that we started collecting is giving us this number, near, newly recorded cases of FGM and this total attended, again, just to clarify that. And also 43 newly recorded cases of FGM involve women and girls born in the UK. And this was surprising to many people in terms of type 4, which everybody tends to shy away from. So again, this is giving us some more robust data in terms of um, type 4. Um, the response um, with the NHS, which is the National Health um, Services, they believe that, whoops, they believe that it's very important, obviously, to share good practice and to develop commissioning um, pathways and quality standards. Right, so we've been talking about FGM in the UK since 1980, early 80s, thanks to people like um, Ifwa Doquino, which you all know, uh, may her soul rest in peace, and also people like um, Waris Deeries, people like um, Shamis Diris as well from Black Women's Health and Family Support. So again, it's very important that we commission the right um, services for women and girls. It's very important that we look at the quality standards. Um, now, what we need to start looking at uh, is the psycholo psychological well-being of women and girls, which we haven't really touched uh, much in the UK. We are having discussion around that. It's very important to share good practices, like I said. This is um, what um, um, the response from um, NHS England, so you can read that quickly then go to the next one again this is from NHS England is for them is very important that we work together to end FGM I guess that's why we're all here to share new approaches to look at what works and what doesn't work and um, like I said, we've been working around FGM for about 30-something years in the UK. It's important to move forward. We had about the critical analysis of um, Tosten yesterday, and it's not like the presenter said, it's not just Tosten, it's most of the NGOs. So what is the way forward? What can we, how can we better all these NGOs or what can we do to improve? So again, working together, you can see all the strands there, which is very key and very important. Um, I don't know if you can see this very clearly. Again, so this is just to reinforce, again, from the data that we started collecting since um, 2015, I'm not sure if you can see. Again, it specified the different types, the areas, as well as the cases that has been involved and the countries um, that, 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 we, that um, we, we saw at different clinics or GP practices. Um, this is very important because um, Alice is um, obviously, um, if I can use the word, you're kind of frustrated in terms of, <laughs> maybe not, <laughs> you're looking at me, in terms of the work you've done here in Portugal for many, many years, trying to reach the um, health professionals, trying to make sure they're providing the right services for women and girls. And the way it works in the UK, obviously, the model that we use, um, it's, it started mainly from the maternity. And hence, my clinic that we started, um, at Guys and St. Thomas's. I started the clinic about 20 years ago. It was the second clinic. The first clinic was set up by Harry Gordon, and ours was the second um, clinic. And unfortunately, just let me let, tell you, I, I left um, St. Thomas's about two, three weeks ago, and that's always been my plan to retire from um, NHS after working for about 33 years and um, to have early retirement at 55. I'm 55. I was 55 last month 
and to do more work at international and also to support my NGO called Global Comfort. So the system that we have is the clinic is more kind of commissioned from maternity because within maternity you see pregnant women and even within um, gynecology area as well you see women and our clinic we see average of 500 women every year or more um, and we get referrals from all over UK and I do de infibulation and I train doctors, nurses, midwives to do the infibulation. I do average of two every week at the clinic um, when I was there. So again, it's just to share how um, the UK commission um, the services. Like I said, this we now have, when we started at Guy's and St. Thomas's, like I said, it was the second clinic, but I'm really proud to say we now have about 15, 16 clinics all over UK, but we could do it more because of the um, number of women that we see. Again, this is sharing from NHS England um, in terms of the clinics where all the clinics are, as you can see here, staggered everywhere. But the majority of the clinic is based in London, which is the city, unfortunately. And what we were trying hard is for women and girls not to travel from so far to the city. But unfortunately, we do have lots of um, the clinics in, in London. Again, service provision in London, it just shows you um, the Whittington, Enfield, so, which I'm really proud that we now have um, quite a few around in London compared to maybe 15 years ago, 10 year, even 10 years ago. Um, yeah. And this is important. I'll just make reference to this again. You can get this on online. This is provision for, um, provision for confirming suspected FGM in children. This is kind of like a, a standard tools that um, is very now that everybody within um, in, in UK have to use. And that's what I was saying that we have to report on that 18, as you can see here, um, this was introduced in, on 31st October. I would really like to hear your views, maybe during question and answer around this. What do you think? Because like I said, I do have lots of um, general practitioners or nurses or health visitors calling me and say, I have good relationship with this family. I've known them from day one. Why am I going to call the police? Why am I reporting them to the police? But again, the police, on the other hand, will say, well, we're not going to um, imprison the family. It's about gathering intelligence. It's about supporting the girls. It's about safeguarding. So again, how do you balance it? But this is what we, we are now doing in the UK, if you like. Um, we now, uh, when was this, September, about two, three weeks ago, we launched this animation, which is new. Um, it was done by the Royal College of Midwives and the Royal College of Obstetric and Gynecology. So please check it out. I did say to them that I'm going to promote it. It has three strands. You can get it on, uh, online. Yeah, please, yeah. So again, this is very new. Um, and they're looking to, um, as you can see, to develop it in, three, in six other languages. So it will be available for you to use. It will be available for you to use in schools and in all your training as well. It's, it's, it's really good. Um, do I have time to talk about the infibulation? Oh, no. Okay, we'll leave the infibulation. I was going to put that in because that's the key thing that we do at Guy's and St. Thomas's anyway. Um, we'll leave that. Um, let me see. Right, so I think what I'm going to quickly mention about de which is um, 
um, reversal. Again, I always say to people, I try hard not to call it reversal, because if you call it reversal, it implies that you're putting everything back to normal, which is not the case. I have lots of young people coming to me and saying, Comfort, can you put my clitoris back? Comfort, can you put my labias back? When you sit them down, explain and show diagram of what you do, they get really upset that you can't put things back together. But now I, you know about Dr. Folder's work and um, the clinic in Berlin where they try to reconstruct the clitoris as well. So I do make sure I refer um, women to that clinic. So I um, don't have much time. Let me see what else I have. Take home message, obviously. Working in partnership is very, very key, um, very important, and also to safeguard girls and women. I always say women as well because I've had cases where we've had like a 40-year-old woman that was subjected to FGM. So please be, be, have it in mind that it's not just the young girls, some women might be at risk of FGM as well. Look for the indicators, as you can see. Think about other children and families. Make referral where necessary. More research is needed, it's for me, especially around the psychological well-being for women and girls. Um, it's about changing mindset and attitude, setting up standards is very key and very important and I'm sure that's what you you're doing here um, Alice um, within the pro, um, healthcare professionals and also reduce the need for women having to go on waiting lists. I think why I put that there because I'm not sure what you do here at the moment in um, Portugal because when we first started um, women were having women that needed um, defibrillation were having to go on the waiting list for so long and I remember I had to discuss with the director um, of the hospital when I first started that this is a minor procedure they don't have to go on waiting list for two three months because for for me from working with women once they made the decision that they want the defibrillation they want the services that can provide that ASAP for them and then we set up I think it was only guys and St. Thomas's that have a one-stop clinic where the women or girls can call me and see me the same day if they need defibrillation. So it'll be important if you can have similar service here, one-stop clinic. Advocating for users is very key, very important. And we have all these um, leaflets that we use in terms of campaigning. And we put them in the toilets, in GP services everywhere. So again, it's about encouraging um, people working around domestic violence, around FGM to make sure all these flyers are around and um, so that people are aware of it. Yeah? I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, dear Comfort. Now, um, let's listen and learn <laughs> with Ho Ho. <laughs> oh, ho. Um, the FGM is part of the most complex statistical data collection operations that a country needs to undertake. The data research can be used for many purposes, and our next speaker from the Karolinska Institute, with the generosity recognized to the great female researchers, is going to share her knowledge and main aim strategies and challenge for treating and caring for girls and women living with FGM. Dear Ho Ho, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning. And again, thank you for, for being here. I'm hoping to talk very quickly and in summary form, and I'm hoping that um, this will give us more time for discussions and questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really going to race through this. Just also to tell you that I, I've written a fairly slightly dense document. It's about nine pages, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, 
a lot of the contextual background about what we're trying to do in Sierra Leone is in there. So I, I haven't put it here, but it, it's probably worth reading if you want to get a, a better view of it. That's me, that's my name, that's what I'm going to talk about. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, oh, am I doing the? Should I be? No, I'm. I'm. I'm not. It hates me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can go this way. Voila. Okay, just to make sure we are on the same page. This is what we're talking about. We know this. Uh, on procedure on girls and women, what it removes injury to genital organs for non-medical reasons, probably the most important. WHO has classified it. We, we know this from all we've been doing. Sierra Leone. I'm from Sierra Leone. I'll be talking about um, an institutional response from Sierra Leone. We're in Africa. I say this because people ask me if it's the Caribbean, it's in a state in America. We're in Africa, okay? <laughs> we're, we're sitting there. So just to be clear, this is what the country looks like. These are sort of um, districts. Um, I was very privileged because in the work that I've done, I've had the opportunity to travel all the districts talking about FGM. I don't think many people do that in my country. Um, what about FGM in Sierra Leone? This is our prevalence, 90%, let's call it. Um, after the war, 2005 was about 94%, so we've dropped actually. What kinds do we do? Um, type 1B. 2B and 2C, I leave it at these very specific types because I am a researcher and we need to know it because we need to know the um, anatomical description of what is happening with girls and women because it's a dose response thing. The, the more extensive the cut, the more the consequence of health complications. So I tend to leave it like that. For us, it's interesting in Sierra Leone because often we say, ah, it's just a little nick of the clitoris, isn't it? But actually, you type 2B is the most um, uh, prevalent of the types that are seen in Sierra Leone. When does it occur in Sierra Leone? <clears throat> um, it's part of an initiation um, ceremony of the Bundes Society, all women um, led, very powerful politically group and this is part of the initiation ceremony as you move from a girl to being a woman and being recognized in your community within your ethnic group as a woman so they're mende timini limba so if i'm a mende girl i will join a mende bundo group to become a woman if i'm a timini girl i'll join a timini bundo group i won't cross lines okay the act of cutting is just one part of it as you can see lots of other things happen in there but um, really, you should probably read a little bit more about it. I, I don't have the time to go into it here, but that's where FGM occurs. We, we developed a strategy over a period of two years. It was interrupted by Ebola. And the reasons why we did that is because of the demographics. Nine out of 10 females have undergone FGM. A potential increase in harm because um, the age at FGM was dropping in Sierra Leone. You can look at DHS, which will give you that information. And then we had an increased evidence base. We're beginning to research. Sierra Leoneans were, for the first time, beginning to research on FGM in Sierra Leone. And we had a lot of information and said, okay, so what do we need to do with this information? And we said, okay, one of the things that we can do, uh, the Ministry of Gender, um, supported um, largely by UNICEF, commissioned the development of a strategy. The vision is very clear, Sierra Leone free from FGMC. There are debates about that. Please read this stuff because it's not as clear cut. It's, it's a process. But our goal was to reduce um, FGMC by 20% for, for girls between 2020. Of course, we're talking about girls because at nine out of 10 um, women have been, been cut. We can't achieve that reduction amongst women. It's, it's got to be girls. There are three pillars of the strategy. I'm just going to concentrate on this one because that's the one I, I want to drill down on. And that's the one that reflects an, an institutional response in health to women living with FGM. The others you can look at as well. So what we said in this pillar two is 
national capacities um, exist and within those national capacities, education and health particularly, we want to see how we can care and prevent FG, um, and care for women and girls living with FGM. Um, because from the research that we have, certainly the health research, um, this is, um, FGM is a public health concern. I, I say this because when I started researching and I met the chief medical officer at the time, he became a personal friend, and I said, I want to research in FGM, and he said, okay, you want me, they want them to sack me from my job. And I said, no, I don't. I said, but I need your permission. I need you to sign papers. I need to get into ANCs. I need to get into district hospitals. And he said, I can't do that. And I just said, please. And he said, okay. But, you know, this is the terms and condition. We signed a sort of pact understanding. And he said, and I said, what are we going to do with the results? And he said, okay, if you can prove to me that this FGM thing is a problem and there are complications that girls are reporting because the, re the work that we did was self-reporting. She said, he said, I will flag it up personally as a public health concern. And that's what we did. Um, it took us about four years. We got some data and he said, now this is a public health concern. We have to respond to it. So that's the power of actually having the evidence that we can go back with. But we realize our healthcare workers, in the little training we did as part of our research, they, they really don't know about the consequences. You know, um, it's, it's, I don't know whether it's the forests and trees things, but sometimes you can be so close to an issue that you don't see it. And um, don't blame the healthcare workers in Sierra Leone um, completely. One, one, a friend of mine, a healthcare worker, put it like this. And he said, he said, you know, when you're examining women or doing a sort of a, a genital inspection for whatever reason in Sierra Leone, and nine out of ten women have been cut, you only realize that, oh, there's one that something is wrong with. Oh, she's not cut. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's the complete opposite. So we don't see the complications from FGM, <laughs> you know, because they, they're always there. And so managing, preventing, there is some medicalization. It's not as high as in Guinea, but it's, it is creeping up. I, I teach at the College of Medicine, so we have these debates um, with um, training medical students about medicalization. But also, if we know that these women are suffering these complications, then we can do something with regard to planned pregnancy and childbirth and you know, postpartum period. Again, you can look at the WHO research, which shows that of these obstetric outcomes, which are likely with women with FGM. And as everybody has been man mentioning, the whole issue of counseling, um, very important. So what we're going to do as part of this pillar two, and we want to develop a module to address um, FGM complications and prevent medicalization for health professionals. And just to make a cap to Adriana's fine work that she's doing in Gambia, if as we go through the stages we find that there's something that Adriana has already done in Gambia, we're going to steal it. It's very simple. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. But this, it's in, st in three stages. First, we want to find out what people actually know, and that's, that's the stage we are. Mm -hmm. What are their views, experiences? How can we measure the knowledge of the practice, medicalization, knowledge of complications? We've kind of started that work, but we want to concretize it and we want to make it nationally representative. We also want to find out who are the best people to train. Um, we don't have a lot of gynecologists and obstetricians in my country. Perhaps we have five. I think three have retired, okay? Um, but you have these front, hair, um, um, front women who are frontline workers who have these health posts, for example. They might be the ones that we need to train as a first off. So we want to find out that information. And that's why we want to do the CAP. And then the second thing is that this CAP is used for tra developing a training module and then actually evaluating how that training module is going. So that's, that's part of our strategy and part of the activity that we're trying to do. Weaknesses and threats. Um, this, is not a, this is not a done deal. We're in the process. Um, as a researcher, you also have to be a politician. So you have to negotiate. You have to understand the process in which people are, um, various stakeholders, the kinds of power they have, communities, and you understand that it's a works in, pro in process and how to gather information that people need 
to make those decisions and, and to change policy and, and sometimes also to change behavior. We're not only about changing attitude, oh yes, I agree, but we also want it eventually to, to, to bring about a, a behavior change. So we, the, the, when I talk about weaknesses and threats, I'm here really talking about the cap because I see that for me as a standalone, um, the, the development of the module is, is further down the road and it's something that's actually been um, commissioned by the College of Medicine. They've asked us to do this, so we stand on, we have a, a very good motivation for it. But the CAP can give us lots and lots of information that we can use in many, many other ways. So we, we're sort of presenting the work in packages that can be sort of standalone activities. So for this CAP, the weaknesses and threats, people answer truthfully. That's, that's kind of important. And again, it's the kind of rapport you uh, develop with people, who you train, who your data collectors and supervisors are. National representation is important because we suspect, as I said, because FGM for us is very closely linked to ethnicity, there's about 14 ethnic groups in Sierra Leone, we expect that, you know, there are going to be nuances there, so to be able to cover the whole country is important. Resources, time, money, and human capacity, and um, one of our biggest political threats right now is that our gender minister is actually not very supportive. Uh, a couple of people were yesterday mentioning this whole idea of, um, I don't even know the term, is it neocolonialism? Mm -hmm. Okay, they're saying, you know, um, yeah, she's, um, yeah, she's really shooting, mm -hmm. <laughs> shooting us in the foot as well as herself. And um, she's basically not agreeable, what she not agree to us writing a strategy like that to, um, um, for FGM reduction in, in Sierra Leone. That's what she's not agree with. Um, so this, this is a, a, it's a kind of stumbling block right now, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that later. We're good at um, moving around stumbling blocks in my country. <laughs> Strengths and opportunities. Um, this module has been commissioned by um, the community health department. The uh, department, they say they want to make it uh, uh, a module available, approved by the Senate and in there so that they can offer it to a whole range of people who go through the college. We've done successful FGM research before, as I mentioned before, with the Ministry of Health and with the College of Medicine, so we're positive that we have a good track record, we were sensitive um, and we could operate um, in, in that context. We have support from development partners. After the strategy was written, DFID and Sierra Leone said, we will give five million um, UK pounds to this strategy. We think it's a good thing. We support you. And they even said in Sierra Leone, wherever you need to go to promote this strategy, we'll go with you and add our voice to it. So, and you know, DFID is just one of the, the people who support this very strongly. There have been other voices as well who support it. For example, our Sierra Leone Human Rights Commission has been a very strong supporter of, of the activity as well. There is national capacity for supporting strategy implementation. I was in home in May this year where I met a whole range of various actors talking about supporting it. It was, it was great with the religious leaders because um, there's a part in the pillar one with the religious leaders. And I said, this is the strategy, this is what we, activities we thought about you. So we had a great day together. And they said to me, don't worry about your minister of gender. We're not under her authority, we're under God. We can do what we like. So I said, okay. <laughs> and I said, money is available. People are prepared to put their money where their mouth is. But the gender um, deputy minister is extremely supportive. She's extremely, I mean, I talk to her on average once a month, long telephone conversations, because she said, we've got to get this going. So that's, that's a real strength for us. These are penguins. I finish with this. Now, penguins can't fly, can they? <laughs> okay, no they can't, but I found this in Swedish, it said, we have told him it wasn't possible, but he wouldn't listen, and that's kind of where I am, that's kind of where we are as researchers and people who are passionate about FGM, and we, it's, it's beyond being passionate about FGM, it's being passionate about girls in Sierra Leone for me, and we refuse to listen, because this, it's just got to be possible. We've just got to find a way to make sure that we can fly. Thank you.
Thank you. Now with Michaela uh, Villani, uh, the reparative approach of FGM is part of the controversial debate. With you, um, some of us are going to pay more attention in taking in account women's meanings of reparation. Michaela, based on your experience in the context of health, monitoring and treatment <coughs> of women's victims of FGM, it would be interesting to understand some of the limits as well as the contradictions that you find in your research work with the women and health system from different countries. Dear Michaela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you also for the organizers of this um, seminar. So I'm, I will stay here because I'm, I'm, I need almost to, to read my speech when I speak in English. So, okay. Oh, it, it doesn't work here? Yeah, oh. uh, okay. Okay, um, this is too much. Okay, <laughs> I will try. <laughs> Uh, no problem. Okay, so when it comes to, um, to think about the institutional responses uh, to female genital mutilation cut in FGMC, in my opinion it's a good idea to start by questioning what FGMC is for women with FGMC. And from what I observe in my different researches, uh, the meaning is strictly related to the context and the opportunities that women have to define things. So for that reason, and with the purpose to enlighten the concept here of reparative approaches, I propose to start by describing the context in which re research, my researches took place. So um, my research took place, as you can read in the, in the title, in European context, in France and in uh, uh, Switzerland. And it is useful to remind, but many, mm, many, present, many speakers just recall yesterday that FGMC uh, are today international defined as a form of violence and a type of gender inequalities. So, um, oh, okay. That. So the two questions that I propose to answer today is uh, um, the first, which are the dimensions involved in the reparation treatments and uh, which are the meanings that women living in the north give to the term of, of reparation. So uh, before going through the results, uh, I propose to give you just some elements that describe the, the, the context and, uh, um, and uh, I, um, okay, I show these images that, uh, uh, just to say that in the, since uh, the early of 2000, a new surgical technique appears, as you know, the clitoris reconstructive surgery, which introduced also the necessity to develop a specific medical protocol run up the surgery. And this is particularly true in France, where two conditions met. Uh, one, the reconstructive surgery uh, first appeared and was developed by a French urologist, Pierre Foldès, which started to operate since uh, the beginning of 2000. And two, the surgery was recognized and totally reimbursed by the public health insurance called the Sécurité Sociale. And this is a very important passage because it transformed a simple medical act into a social and healthcare policy and establishes by that a new right, precisely the right to, to reparation, the droit à la réparation. So um, then we, we, I, I, I propose to keep in mind, uh, on one hand, the intention to condemn by law and to eliminate FGMC practice, as this is particularly true in uh, France, which have a long um, history of penalization of uh, FGM, and on the other hand, um, how medicine invests new efforts to repair the damages provoked by FGMC. And uh, um, here is also particularly important all the advances in uh, study of uh, clitoris, as that's why I put these uh, uh, images and I gave you some um, references which are quite old now, but that just show that the, the, um, the, well, the, volunteer, the, the, the volunteer of um, um, uh, update the, um, the um, clitoris anatomy. 
Okay, so um, I will go very quickly on the methods and just to say that uh, my results that I present today come from um, uh, the semi-structured interview, uh, in-depth interviews that I uh, conducted with uh, a total of 40 women, um, 40 women that have been interrogated on the meaning to, that they give to the term of reparation within their health and sex sexual life. Uh, in this uh, group, uh, the, we have uh, eight immigrant women, which means uh, uh, first generation women, um, first generation women uh, living in Switzerland with type 3, uh, so-called infibulation, and 32 women of first and second generation living in France with type 2, so the, ex the excision, and uh, asking for uh, the rec clitoris reconstruction. So uh, I will do not detail here the um, demographic characteristic of these two groups, which are actually very different uh, in the, for their social demographic characteristics and also the context of FGM. But what is important to say is that both groups affirm their desire to improve or, or at least change their condition. And the reparative approaches are evoked by women um, which would repair uh, something considered as lost or stolen. And so in this sense, the word reparation acquires a large scale of meanings uh, and dimension, which are not only physical, but also psychosexual, social, and moral. And I will go into detail. So the first and the most evident meaning of reparation is the physical reconstruction by surgical technique. And this is what I find in the, which I, what I found in the, uh, the French context. These requests start from women's feeling of having been damaged and the feeling that something of the body misses. Uh, women report the sensation to feel limited in their activities and especially when they are asked to be naked like in a locker room of the gym or swimming pool or when they are in intimate encounters with the partner. So the request to be reconstructed is here intended as the desire to reconstruct what has been cut. And as I say, this is particularly true for the type 2 the excision. And they uh, express like uh, in that way. So I want to be a whole woman or an all-around woman, or I don't feel normal, and uh, I want to be as all other women. And this is intended all other women that uh, have no FGMC in France or in Switzerland. So the second, uh, um, okay, and, and I let you just read in the other uh, extract of the, um, of the, um, yes, of the interview. So the second uh, meaning is linked to the, this feeling of missing, and women report the idea of loss and theft. And most of the time, FGM uh, um, is performed on very young girls, as we seen yesterday, the age is decreasing. And for most of them, before the age of five, and the, the, we, uh, I have a great number of women that have no memories of this moment. So these women say that they discover their, uh, their FGM later, during adulthood, or during their first sexual experiences. And they clearly, clearly express uh, the feeling that something has been taken away without asking or that something has been stolen from their body without their consent. So they underline the feeling of body integrity loss, which is accompanied by the sentiment to have been subjected to a violent experience and an abuse. And this feeling uh, that something has been lost or uh, stolen feeds this sentiment to deserve justice, which becomes, for some of them, an explicit claim. And this is particularly true for the second generation uh, women asking for clitoris reconstruction. So some of them uh, clearly say, I want to have my clitoris uh, back, even if it doesn't work, when the medical team explained that maybe uh, the surgery will not um, restore all the sensation. Um, so, um, 
just when we, we look at uh, the quotes, uh, we can uh, see on this kind of speech, um, I'm, I think that enable us to identify a political claim uh, over the body's integrity and the right to control it and operate on it in their, uh, their own choices. Uh, but uh, this, um, so mm, the, the women, uh, by, t uh, by affirming this kind of uh, asking, well, I want to pick my clitoris up again, or I want that they give me uh, back what they've taken without, without asking me, they also are affirming the recognition of their, ra of their right to dispose and control their own body. And we see uh, yesterday that uh, this kind of uh, um, mm, uh, right is uh, not um, possible to, uh, to achieve for women that they do not have the possibility to uh, express like, uh, like that. So um, I pass to the third meaning which, is, uh, which concerns, ah, okay, I'm sorry, this is some example that I wanted to to give to you, and this is actually this is the kind of speech that uh, allow allows to um, yes to um, see more the political claim. I mean, what I can because uh, they say, okay, I have a clitoris as all other women, so the mm, the claim is demanding equality actually. But we can come back. I'm sorry. So the third meaning is very connected, but, but it concerns more of the sexual dimension. And uh, so I go over there. And especially for excised women, uh, the excised women in uh, the French context um, express the, some of them the dissatisfaction or they say, they say that themselves as unhappy in their sexual life. And um, it is also important to um, keep in mind that um, a great number of uh, women, especially of the second generation, are in a mixed couple with an European male partner who most of the time does, doesn't know or know very little about uh, the practice of FGM and the, the purpose also, the assertion that these partners may have could be also very harmful to these women. Uh, and, um, and make them vulner uh, vulnerable. Uh, but also, uh, I make some uh, um, quotes here uh, uh, just to show that these women living in the north, uh, in Western countries, uh, deal with other social norms, with, uh, that the, which, which are uh, sexual norms, uh, of um, um, the female, um, female sexuality in, uh, in, the, in the north, and uh, uh, which demands to women also to be more active and more uh, um, also performant, more um, uh, deal with uh, an other, uh, another time type of uh, sexuality. Uh, this is particularly evident for the, sec the last quote I put, uh, um, and I let you read. So I arrived to the last dimension con which concerns uh, gender and, um, and to say that the, some uh, women underline that the bodies they have do not correspond to the body they want. And this is uh, also, again, particularly high for the second generation. Uh, and so I refer especially to the French, uh, uh, the French context, because in Switzerland I had also only uh, first generation, but it's just a question of time because uh, we have uh, the second generation women in, in Switzerland, just uh, in uh, some years they will enter into sexualities. So we will have to deal also with that. So I will trying to go very quickly to the hand uh, and uh, I have uh, uh, here some quotes that uh, um, uh, yes, show how these women can expose themselves to um, also some uh, violence uh, in uh, living with FGM. Some of the speakers said also before uh, the, um, 
the, the fact to be a uh, cat uh, could be uh, see as a social stigma in the north. So uh, they have, uh, um, they also use the term of feeling themselves like abnormal or different from other women. Okay, so uh, if we arrive to the end and try to detail what is these uh, reparative approaches, and as I said at the beginning, I wanted to start by what women say. Um, let's um, just have this point uh, that express what is, um, that um, um, synthesize what is uh, just done and is going to be uh, do now. And, um, and it, that is that uh, um, medicine and uh, specific health care, health care service needs to uh, consider all these different dimensions in the, um, in the idea of reparation. So the multidisciplinary team uh, is something that is just ex ex experimented on in uh, I started to observe the first multidisciplinary team in uh, Paris, but now there's uh, many in other parts of the France and also in Belgium and other countries in uh, Europe. And this is now something that is becoming a protocol. Uh, the, the other point uh, was that creating places where words could be said and also support speaking and sharing activities and this is also uh, the, something that, uh, okay, the idea that we need to talk about and uh, not feel uncomfortable uh, to, to just open the, the, the possibility to talk. And uh, starting from women's definition of the problem, not to define in her place, this is also very important, and so support uh, the counseling and the self-questioning pro uh, process which sometimes uh, take uh, long times, and at uh, the end, which is very connected, I mean, uh, promote the culture of uh, the love of self, which also means uh, respect, self-esteem, and the capacity of pose uh, boundaries between me and the others. So I finish here, and uh, just I let you some of uh, uh, things that I uh, write and okay thank you very much Michele um, can we May I put you f the same question to all of you and then open the floor, okay? My point is, um, dear Comfort, you started the work in UK in some lots of years ago, 20 years ago, as you said. Can you have some bullet points for the, the prof health professionals, for the national health system in Portugal, that uh, what they need to do, because we have already the training, we have the, the, the old materials, the, the translation of WHO guidelines, the translation of everything, but uh, midwives, uh, gynecologists, uh, health, uh, family doctors, and so on, but the investment is, uh, it will be very strong, but nowadays, it seems that they're still waiting for women in the, in the hospitals or in the health centers. Other thing is what you talk about the mandatory reporting. Here in Portugal, this mandatory reporting is only for the national health system. If you are a private clinic, if you are a private doctor, you don't have access to the, on, to the issue of where you need to resist, even it's a public crime, even that. So mm. I'll just talk about this. And then uh, to how, when we talk about, and we know that you are a specific consultant to WHO on the FGM aspect and so on, do you have any specific thing to say to the people that are in this room that work directly 
for the national health system, because it seems nowadays that the, the issue of the counseling, uh, uh, psychology counseling, the issue of sexuality and so on, they are a new way, but the other part is not, we don't have the, uh, the other answers, we don't have the other um, response, because people don't uh, go to the, to the health center to help, to ask support. So what can we do? And for you, um, Ripper, uh, Michaela, do you have any experience with women um, with type 4? And uh, what does it mean uh, nowadays for this reparation of women? Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, to answer the first question, I think it's very important. Yes, you've done all the background work. You've you're training um, doctors, nurses, midwives, or the healthcare professionals. What is so important is reaching out to the communities. It's very key. And I think that is how we in, in the UK have been able to kind of work effectively. And also giving the platform to the women themselves is very important. And I, I remember when I first started 20 something years ago in the UK, FGM was a no-go area. You can't even talk about it. I had stones thrown to me. I had eggs thrown to me that you as an African, you should know better. Why are you putting our linen out there? But I'm really happy now that we've given the platform to the survivors that prefer to be called survivors because their, their words and their um, activities is very powerful. We need to be guided by what they want rather than we saying we are the professionals, we know better. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that is the issue here, I'm not too sure, but the professionals here need to give platform to the survivors or the victims, whatever they want to call themselves, but in the UK they prefer to be called the survivors. And like I said, their story is very powerful and they guide us in terms of what they want rather than we saying, this, we are the professionals, this is what we have to do, these are your needs. No, we don't know what their needs. We think we know what their needs are, but we need to listen to them. That is very key and very important. And your second question was, um, what was it again? Yeah? Okay, for now. Okay. <laughs> For me, it's very quickly because I never met a type 4. And, uh, but uh, let's say that this typology is um, sometimes very formal and uh, fictive, fictive um, uh, because we can have a type 2 excision, very severe excision, uh, which gives um, uh, the, the, the labial st uh, stitch and which gives a kind of type 4 when uh, a type 3 uh, infibulation, when uh, a clinician see it, it's sometimes difficult to mm, dis distinguish the type 2 or 3. Or in the other sense, we can have the type 3, but uh, that uh, the labia, uh, the, everything outside is closed, but inside the clitoris is still there, and um, so there's not so much to reconstruct. And this, all that, all that um, kind also of things are going to be updated by um, researchers actually in Switzerland who are working on that. And um, okay, but I, I, I never see time for. I mean. Sorry. In terms of the link elongation, people tend to think, oh, well, we're not, that is not FGM because we haven't removed anything, but it is FGM if you look at um, FGM type 4 by WHO. And the other thing that we professionals or we communities shy away from is type 4 that is happening within um, the West. We're not talking about that because that is double standards. I'm not going to go through into that, but that creates problem when you go out to raise awareness. The community is saying to you, well, the West on one hand, they have labioplasty, they have um, clit um, 
yeah, labioplasty or um, vulvectomy. So what are you doing about that? Recently, I had a, a, a patient that was referred to me by a midwife. She had rings around her labia. She was pregnant. She's had the rings for about five, six, seven years. And now she's coming to have her first baby. She got panicked. She went to the midwife and said, oh gosh, what's going to happen? I've got rings around my labias. What will happen when I'm in second stage of labor, when I'm pushing um, the baby out? So the midwife referred to me and said, oh, we've tried to remove the rings. Can you try and remove the rings? And I'm thinking, if you have tried, there's no way I can try as well. So the best thing is to refer her back to where she had the rings. And so what I'm trying to say here is, because we shine away from this question, we need to be asking everybody about FGM, because you might have somebody who is not from Africa, or who is not from Indonesia or who is not from Malaysia which is the typical um, FGM countries then we're thinking they are okay we as professionals we need to feel comfortable asking the question asking everybody rather than isolating certain people and making assumption that oh that's the type of people once we start feeling comfortable ourselves and looking at FGM as safeguarding rather than looking at FGM it's something that happened to certain people then we can't go wrong thank you I, I probably don't have much more to add to what um, Comfort has said um, the only thing that came to my mind is two things. If you've got all the materials, et cetera, et cetera, for the various cadre of health professionals, is the communication part, um, dare to ask, dare to have that engagement with the, the person who's sitting in front of you. I think that's very important. Um, uh, that's, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, you know, back to the patient, as you were saying, how do they receive it? One of the things that we did in, in Sierra Leone when we're looking at the health complications uh, at ANC Women is just to have a very simple exit um, sort of um, question. You know, so they've been with our data collector, they've um, had a genital inspection, they've had the range of questions. As they leave, we say, do you mind, just, just come. We want to hear how you had it. You know, um, I, I've seen a number of research studies in Canada, quite a bit from USA, which are um, um, Sweden, um, Norway, where women from practicing communities have expressed how they had it, uh, their own experience of the health care received. Um, and it would be interesting perhaps to do some of those kinds of equal studies here. To, to, to have a look at that. The other th kind of thing that's sticking in my head also is, are you sure you are, and I don't know, eh? are you sure that y the materials that you've produced in, in Portugal is for the cater that the women meet? It, it may be yes, yeah? Because that's one of the questions that we have in Sierra Leone, for example. As I say, you know, there's no point spending a lot of time um, at this stage looking at the cap of the doctors they don't go there but I, I need to go to the woman at the health post you know so those questions of where do people go for for care also then Adriana else uh, I don't know your name so lots of questions so please <laughs> Okay, thanks. So thank you very much to all three of you. I really enjoyed all of your presentations very much. And they're all very different. I'll try to be brief. Um, so I don't mean to be provocative, but I'm, I'm very glad you brought up the issue of the double standard comfort because it just seems like a no-brainer that, like, we all, we're all working because we want to seek justice and we're feminists and so on. But the law is racist. <laughs> it is a racist law. So why um, a white European woman can have whatever genital modification that she wants, but an, a woman of an African background cannot, right? And it is a matter of, I personally believe, and I, 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 it's not about my personal beliefs, but I sometimes get attacked. People think that I am defending or pushing against some really great efforts to advance women and girls. 
but uh, personally I believe that if you're over the age of 18 you can consent, you can do whatever you want. So that was the point that you made was also interesting about 40 year old women. So you could just say well that's consent, that's okay. Now I know it's more complicated and again I'm not speaking for anyone, it's in very different uh, contexts. But I, I just wanted to raise two points. The first is about the role of the state. So we all are working uh, within state structures and the National Health Service and so on. But particularly in the UK, and now we have Brexit, and it's becoming extremely um, racist, even more openly racist. So how to work within such a uh, context when in some ways the state is an ally, right, in, in some of your activities, but on the same hand, the state that is further marginalizing um, people from outside Europe through its policies, and then requiring mandatory reporting, which I don't know, I'm not working in the domain, but I think you kind of answered your question, which is, it is not really a good thing to do, I think. So um, I just wanted to raise that um, idea of basically the context, which is that we are working within a racist state situation that is really marginalizing people who are already marginalized. That came up in other presentations. But I just wanted to say another point to Michaela, which was also very interesting, your work, I know. Sorry. <laughs> but. I don't know, there's loads and loads of literature about this, right? And so you, your sort of ethnographic detail was very interesting. I don't have a normal body and so on. But we know that bodies are constructed. So men, men's bodies are modified through circumcision. A piece is removed. So, you know, I think it's very important to look at this context of these um, informants are living in France, where there's a particular idea of a female body. That's not universal, okay? We all modify our bodies. We have piercings, all that kind of thing. So it's very important to look at that context. It's not to say that they are not believing this, but they are a product of a cultural context in themselves. And so th we have to be aware of this re-victimization, you know, and this is very important, I think. So thanks. Sorry. Better you respond. So it, it has been decided we'll just collect several questions, is that it? Okay. One more. Okay, one more. Okay, so my questions actually have a lot to do with what was just asked. Actually, my questions go mainly to Comfort, but not only. Uh, you have a great name. I think if you work as a midwife to be named Comfort is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, my questions had to do, the first, the first one had to do a lot with what Anne-Marie uh, explained yesterday and the conflict of law and what happens in reality and what you mentioned about police and uh, reporting that's of course a big problem anywhere in the world here in Portugal in the UK I'm sure everywhere because it's double binded right because in one sense you report but then you have people against you and you have people feeling that you're being unjust because you're putting all the family at jeopardy etc yeah. etc so I would like if it's possible that you expand a bit on that the second question actually had to do with what our colleague just asked, which is the case of the 40-year-old woman, right? And that brings us to a lot of literature and things that have been written on actually all the women that do consented uh, FM, AGM. And, 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 the, and for me, the main thing is exactly what is the West doing if we all, not, not all, but I mean, if a lot of women, think of the case of Brazil, pay huge amounts of money to modify daily their bodies, you know? Uh, not only it's it's all it's terrible, but it's true. It's it's a it's a fact. You know, you you put silicone, you do vagina, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, it's not the same thing, right? Because it's consented and it's it's they do it. But my question here is, I'm not saying it's correct. It's not it's not a judgment. What I'm saying is, I'm bringing this into the ba brainstorming because what I'm thinking is, okay, what is the dividing line between what is consented by the woman and what is not? You can say that a woman in the West is, you know, subjected to a lot of pressures, peer pressure, male pressure, or not male, just partner pressure to certain models that we have in the West, but so is a woman in any, you know, African or country or coming from a, an African origin. You have the male prejudice, you have a lot of, so just these two things, if you could expand on both of them. Thanks. Okay, regarding the, um, um, the first question regarding um, 
police or um, informing the police? What, what came, like I do lots of schools, um, um, schools as well, and I remember I went to give a talk to a primary school about immediately when the mandatory reporting came on, and I sat with these primary school, there are about 60 of the children, and two of the children raised this question, say, oh, miss, you're saying, oh, if um, our siblings are at uh, risk, we should inform our teacher, we should um, inform the police and all that, because that's what they've told them as well in terms of P um, during the sex education and all that. So I went in to talk to them about their body and if there's other um, unusual things, how to kind of gently report or talk to um, somebody within um, the school or within the family. And two of the children said to me, Miss, if our parents are being prosecuted or taken to prison, what will happen to us? And that really broke my heart. I sat there and I'm thinking, what do I say to this child or these two children? Because we haven't taught that true. Yes, we want to Here's imprison. Oh, sorry. We yes, we want to imprison. Yes, we have the law. But what are we doing to the family? Something that we really need to think about. Yes, the police, the CPS will argue that, well, this is what we have to do. So it's just one example just to, to give it to you. I, I don't have an answer. I have my reservation in terms of um, um, the law, in terms of reporting, recording, and all that. I have my reservation. And then to you, your second question, what was it again, sorry, about the informed, okay, people will argue about informed choice, people will argue about um, consent and all that, but what informs our decision, that's another thing we need to um, kind of look at. I always give example of my daughter, I've got two daughters, can't remember how old they are now, <laughs> they're 27, 28. I remember my first daughter, when she went to uni, everybody in, within her circle had pierced their tongue. She came home and said, Mom, can I pierce my tongue? And I look at her, I'm thinking, okay, she's over 18. I didn't say that, but we had discussion. I, I told her the pros and the consequences and all that. And for me, I was pleased that she came, because she could have easily done it without coming to me. And then we had the discussion. Two, three months later, she came back again, say, because the pressure, everybody, and she wants to belong, she wants to be part of this community or part of the new group that she found. So again, what informs our decision? So again, those are the things that you need to look at. I hope that answered the question. Yes, yeah, I would like just to react to two comments, but very, very quickly, and especially for the, to the first comment to you, Moira, and with, which I, I agree completely, because it's not uh, as to say that there are free women in the Western countries and in the North and the victims in the uh, South, in Africa, but it, it is that um, I, I wanted to show that how these women, and especially the second generation, as I said, uh, consider themselves as French women, just black French women, and they uh, have nothing to do with Africa. And some of them, this is their story, and some of them, they've never been in African countries or just once when they were very little. Uh, some of them uh, want just to, to, to cut with their, um, or the origin of their parents, and they want to integrate in the country where they live. So um, I think they deal really with the transnational identities and uh, sometimes we want to keep them to their African origins and they don't want. So. Oh, do you want to react to any of the comments? No? <laughs> so let's listen to Adriana. And then yeah, I will go um, quickly. Thank you very much to um, the three of you, and I want to comment or ask something to the three of you. Uh, comfort, congratulations to the UK to wake up after 30 years, since 1985, 
and do something and think about something and move on um, because of the great population you do have, so it's never late, but it's been a nightmare during, during this past 30 years. So please, when, when you wake up after this nightmare of 30 years, um, as you say, there is a lot of confusion in the UK. You talk about mandatory recording, you talk about mandatory reporting. What are we talking about? Are, are, are we looking at the women? What, what, why are we counting? What are we counting for? What are we counting? That. Uh, Michaela. Michaela, thank you very much. You're very brave because it's a very... Um, uh, no, it's not delicate. Uh, when we talk about African women, it's not mm -hmm, delicate. I try to find the word. I will find it. Um, do you remember, I think you were in La Sorbonne in this seminar about, where were you, that Dr. Folders? Do you remember this big, tall African woman that stood up and said, listen, I'm fed up. I'm fed up of you white people telling me whether I feel, I don't feel, how I feel. <laughs> Before I came to France, I never had any problem. I never questioned my sexuality. And since I'm here, everybody's asking me, are you okay? Do you feel, do you? So let's think about this and how this reconstruction or whatever issue is, is sometimes a political issue. Because for example, in Spain, Okay, I want to be critical. In Catalonia, for example, uh, there is no care about these women. There is no, it's very difficult unless you, you do it, uh, that there is a systematic training of health professionals, social workers, people who is dealing with the families. They don't do that work for prevention and, and caring of these women, but it's a big thing that was in all the media about the, the social security will pay for all the reconstructions, et cetera, et cetera. The reaction was that many people that is suffering from the restrictions in the public health system that have been waiting for maybe two years to be operated of something, there is a priority to reconstruct the clitoris of a woman. How many women will reconstruct their clitoris? Okay, so it's a political thing. So this is something I, I want to, to tell you because it's, um, this love of self to promote, to educate, to respect, this self-esteem that you're talking about that is so important. Um, I think it's also very important because in the, in the, wait, I don't want to take it long, but I, I think it's, it was so good and it's so important to, uh, to talk about this because it was a Maimuna, a slide that you showed um, about Maimuna, and Maimuna was saying, um, something like, I want to please him. No, I, I cannot see it, it's small. I want to please him. I want to make sure that I please him. And this is something that, let's think about that. Because it's not only Maimuna. It's Maimuna, it's Mary, it's Juana. Okay? What about pleasing ourselves? And you talk about self-esteem. And you talk about l love. And this is what we need to teach, but not only to African women that don't have a clitoris. It's a general gender issue for all women. And then the last thing, oh, a brief, brief, brief. I'll try. Uh, oh, uh, it's, I'm very proud that you're taking the methodology. Um, I think it's good because you're going the right path. And um, science has to be generous. The only thing just mention the source, because sometimes this is something that is, is, is lacking. With you, you're a very honest and ethic scientist, so I trust, okay, and I'm very happy to hear that. One question, a uh, very serious question to you. Um, we've read that during the Ebola time, they have stopped F practicing FGM. Now that there is no Ebola, has that been sustained? The stop of FGM during Ebola time uh, has stopped, or is there any change? Thank you. Maybe because there are plenty of questions for all three, we should just answer these briefly and then we okay, I just the reacted your question Sorry. and thank, thank you very much, Adriana, because it's an excellent question. And the, you're right, actually, there's many women starting to feel uh, bad when they discover that they, are, they, uh, they have been cut and before they, they didn't feel like to be different. So something happened 
when a doctor say, okay, you have been cut, or a partner say you are not normal, you have no clitoris. So they change the way they, they also they feel, and they start also the question how I feel, and if I feel enough or not enough. But I, I would like to say just uh, welcome to the club, because this is the story of all women, and also the white women, and the story of the cultural excision, uh, with, at, that happened also in Western countries in our history, and uh, um, and the, these women just deal with all other women also deal to this kind of questions, not to feel enough or good enough or not to, to be. Um, so I mean. We share the, the same problem, but they think that is because of excision or FGM. But uh, it's um, not only. I mean, it's not that just to minim minimize, minimize the problem, but there's a lot of other things that uh, just going into FGM, and this is not the. Sorry, Adriana, I, I was trying to make a joke uh, using a shortcut. This is what I meant when I said, I will steal from you. There, there are three stages to the work. The cap is indigenously from Sierra Leone because we want to understand what is Sierra Leone. The other stage is when it actually comes to the modul, module dev development. And this is what I really should have said. There's a lot of material out there, so we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Of course, we'd approach you and anybody else who's got material for permission to use that material as part of our training. Th that's really what I meant because, you know, you and I, we've had this discussion before that there's a lot of, you know, material that people have developed which is totally adequate, it just needs to be adapted and really that's what I wanted to say. I'm sorry if, uh, if I gave the imp impression that I was really literally going to steal it, but of course naturally we would approach you and make sure everything is copyrighted, permission, license, etc. So that's, that's what I was, that's what I have imagined as being a subsequent stage once we know what people would need in terms of module. Ebola. Ebola, Ebola, yes. E, um, chiefs, we have chiefdoms within districts during Ebola. Um, the chiefs passed bylaws, which is only for your chiefdom. Um, uh, penalties, usually money or other things saying, please don't cut because of, of the blood risk, etc. cetera. Um, I, I was in Sierra Leone during this time. We knew that they were moving into Guinea. Um, families were, especially with the um, distri um, border districts. Um, they held, for the most part, there were incidences, but not many. Um, as soon as um, 2016, January, March, Ebola um, finished, they came back again and said, we're ready to start cutting now. Um, it's not strange because we didn't have the time during the mor moratorium to really address the social convention, which is cutting. You know, we, we didn't do any work. You know, so it's not so strange that it came back. Um, so yes, FGM is still continuing there. Just in one word, quickly, regarding mandatory recording, mandatory reporting, who are we doing it for? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Uh, the government doing this mandatory recording, mandatory reporting for funding issues, or are they really thinking about the women or the survivors? S sorry, sir, let's respect an order. No, it's not. The reporting, no. When, when, you, when you have a, um, on that 18, you have to tell her, that you're going to inform the police. You call 101 and inform the police and they are going to do their own general investigation. So it's not anonymous. I know. So it's for security reasons. Uh, please, I will talk in Portuguese. Someone can translate to English? Okay. Uh, so, uh, oh, okay, so, so. You tell me the question I translate, okay? So, I'm the first man, maybe, question here? Maybe I'm a woman standing by you. 
It's like a tsunami. 80% in 2017. Yeah, it's incredible this uh, prevalence rate of 80% in O's presentation, I think. What I saw is uh, sensitization. Um, demonstration of what happens to a woman that suffers from clitoris amputation. The cost to psychology, psychological costs and to her happiness. The doesn't have value. It's it's uh, invaluable. The costs for health are very big. They are not. Uh, I don't understand what you mean. Charged. Okay, someone, let's suppose that someone from an African country has come here, e é tratado cá. Uh, treated here, Tem um custo. Ha, it has one cost, yes. Não é cobrado a ela, ou melhor, ao país de origem dela. It's not charged to her uh, origin country, porque não é possível. because it's not possible. Por causa da consciência das sociedades europeias e outras semelhantes because of the conscience of European societies and others similar to them. Yep. But the costs are there. Quem os paga? Who pays them? São os cidadãos it's the citizens país. of the countries. Elas não sabem. Por isso, como dizem, they don't know, like Mas Michaela said. Uma pergunta, uma, uma senhora francesa, sobre isso, eu perguntei pela África, when you ask a, a French woman about it, they w she would say she will say that she doesn't know it's uh, in Africa. I don't know anything about it. It's difficult for them to feel what victims suffer. Then you have to. Governments have to uh, make uh, measures more drastic to eradicate, to eradicate FGM. Tell me. Is it more difficult to eradicate a human attitude or, or Ebola? or cancer, or diabetes. It's not more difficult than that. It's a lack of will. It's, we should eradicate it from the face of the earth. One of the methods that humans feel ah, it's to take something from them. It's to make them pay for something. To, to, to cost the costs of the health support and the happiness of the victim. Tem que ser mais breve, peço desculpa. Imagina, na nossa sociedade, cobrar um imposto é um pouco difícil. Imagine in our societies to make a tax is uh, kind of difficult. Mais difícil é cobrar algo a alguém lá dá. Even more difficult is to charge someone in Africa because you don't have an organized system. But then you go and take her, his 
chicken. chicken. And you will feel. So the 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 criminal has to feel that he is making uh, some someone lose something. Okay, so the the idea is that is if you take something from him, you will feel and then realize that he's doing something wrong that should be eradicated. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, very much for sharing that. I just to say this is a valu valuable argument, the uh, economic argument, and I just say that. I uh, just um, start to, uh, to um, join a new team that uh, we will work on the socioeconomic uh, uh, aspect and the cost because uh, if it's uh, uh, totally reimbursed in France and now also in Belgium, but it's not the case in the other countries. In Switzerland, it, it, it it's a real problem. It's not uh, assurance, uh, insurance, uh, uh, which are private. Um, this is, um, I mean, something that uh, will be subjected to the bet. But just let me say that France, uh, uh, she, pay, um, she pays the hit uh, um, colonial past. And so this is something that she can deal with that. Can I just say something to this uh, <laughs> this person? The, the idea, a idea de que os países são responsáveis pelos seus cidadãos e então têm que os fazer pagar é uma ideia que vai muito ao encontro da extrema direita e das ideias de que uh, discriminatórias que temos visto por aí a circular. Portanto, eu teria algum cuidado nessa responsabilização que o senhor está à procura. De, dos países africanos e tirar-lhe uma coisa para eles se darem, se darem conta. Mas não vamos entrar em debate nós os dois, vamos deixar as pessoas falar. Mas eu peço desculpa, mas tinha que dizer isto. I will be uh, very brief. I just want to react on your remark in relation to uh, reconstructive surgeries and the fact that when people come to Europe, um, African women, that they maybe um, rethink their sexuality. Uh, I personally quite disagree with your viewpoint, and that's because um, I wrote an article for a UK journalist uh, website, an academic article, uh, and I interviewed Marcy Bowers, which is a um, surgeon from the United States who is performing these kind of operations. And I don't know how, but this article is spread all over Africa, and every other week I do receive an email from a lady from an African country. Last week uh, I received an email from a lady from Nigeria, the week before from a lady from Guinea asking me for help because she found out by reading this article that reconstructive surgeries do exist and that it is possible to um, restore um, what has been done to them. So it's not only um, just this to show you that um, it also comes from the African people, so to say, if you want to put it that way. Um, so there is a request as well, and that's actually why I wanted to pose you a question, uh, because I try to direct those uh, women as much as I can. So I try to connect them to doctors. I know that there is a doctor in Senegal. I know that there is a doctor in um, Burkina Faso. Uh, also in the Netherlands, I have um, good contact with uh, doctors performing the reconstructive surgery. Uh, but this is also a request to everyone in this room. If you, I would like to make like a list of countries and a list of doctors that do perform these kind of surgeries so I can direct people to the right places. And I was wondering whether you know uh, in which countries uh, these operations currently exist. Of course, it's always a problem that these operations are very expensive and they um, often there's a lack of money. Um, but it's just a very practical question, like where do these operations exactly take place? Do you have like contact details for me? And um, that would be of a great help. Thank you. Can I just quickly answer that? Because there is a big request for it now, because mo I will say 50% of the women that I see at Guy's and St. Thomas's request to have reconstructive surgery, and I always 
give them information about Dr. Folders. I always give them information about the one in Berlin. Um, the difference between the two is Dr. Folders obviously charges about 3,000 euro. And unfortunately, the client that I see cannot afford that. But the one in Berlin, which I'm going to visit um, in the next two months, because I've made referrals, referred so many women there, and they've come back with feedbacks and all that. And I just feel strongly that if I'm referring women to a certain clinic, I want to see, visit the clinic myself, meet the surgeons, m see what exactly they're doing so that I feel confident and comfortable referring women to them. But the difference between the Berlin one is you don't pay because what is dear is foundation subsidized for it. And also you just look for your own um, fair ticket, and we're really lucky we've got EasyJet and all um, um, f um, low cost, yeah, that's the word, low cost. So I do encourage women and I do give them the inf information because that is, if, if that will help you psychologically, if that will help your well-being, then why not? Um, but then saying that I've seen women that have been to for reconstruction and they've come back to me and say comfort it hasn't helped me and it's made things worse i have a friend really dear friend to me she's from nigeria she's a, a barrister she had fgm type 1 and i remember when she had her first baby about 15 16 years ago she came to me and she said comfort there's something missing and um Obviously, that is how she felt, that I don't feel I'm a woman. Da, da, da. So I, she wanted me to assess her. I assessed her, confirmed that she had type 1. And my advice to her was she, she had a little bit of her clitoris still there. And I said the best thing is not to do anything. But obviously, she wanted an answer. She went to Dr. Folders, and then she went to... Um, the Berlin. So she's kind of been in and out, in and out. She's been about four times. And for me, this is really sad because what is this doing to her psychological well-being? So again, we have to give the women the opportunity to explore this. But before I send women to either of the two clinics, I always say, look, it is a 50-50%. It might work for you, it might not. So it's really important to, to be honest with them, not to raise their expectation and all that. But the services are there. We need to promote it. Okay, I, have, um, I would like to thank all the three of you for very interesting presentations. I have a question for Comfort. Um, thanks for the update on what's happening in, in the UK. Um, my impression is that in the UK, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but my perception is that in the UK it is perceived as having a court case is an indicator of being successful in doing something against FGM. And when I hear about this mandatory recording and reporting, I have some alarm bells ringing in my head. So my question is, because I know The Guardian had this campaign against FGM, my question is, what are your views on how this campaign by the press influenced this uh, direction or into more repression or, or taking more repressive measures rather than focusing on prevention or attitude change or working mm. with communities? I, I think with the Gaijin paper, I think they've changed to their name, they've changed their name to something else now. But I think what they are looking art is raising awareness that that is what they're doing because i work closely with them i i, I do work closely with them and i've been to nigeria with them what their 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 approach is like they want to work with grassroots media people to kind of um, support them as we speak they are in kenya they they kind of collect <laughs> all the local media people like radio tv um people working on the ground and they have a boot boo, what's it called boot camp to kind of give them tools and information about okay how are you going to take the messages to your villages 
to the rural areas because these are the people, these media people, the young people, or even the older people, they are the ones that can go into the rural area either via um, radio or via other uh, means. And that, that is their approach, trying to kind of give these local people the tools and um, and 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 the the support basically because like I said I've been with them when we went to Nigeria and that's the system they use but for for me what they're doing is raising awareness rather than influencing or um, um, looking at the law I might be wrong but that's what I know that they do is about raising awareness and is about working with the local media to kind of sustain and kind of generate more um, awareness raising within the local community yeah <coughs> okay uh, boa tarde já né já passou um ao meu dia uh, vai ter que traduzir <coughs> okay Eu queria primeiro de tudo felicitar uh, as oradoras. Uh, fiquei aqui no meu canto calada porque tenho dificuldades com o inglês, como já devem, já devem perceber. She's a little silent because she has some problems with her English. Uh, mas uh, percebi que na, na, na explanação de todas elas, she hasn't todas stood in the explanation of everyone. Falaram da reparação das, das sequelas uh, da prática. Uh, re recovery, reparation? Uh, eu queria, sinceramente, uma coisa que já me vem à cabeça há muito tempo para perguntar. Like uh, something that has been in my mind for long. Uh, a reparação das sequelas resultantes da prática da mutilação genital feminina. Sequels of... uh, depois de uma mulher ser submetida a essa reparação, After cons the reparation? conseguem também recuperar Can you also recover? algum dos funcionamentos desses órgãos perdidos the ou é só uma questão de estética? Organs or is just an aesthetic reason? reason. Okay. Uh, obrigada. Thank you. Uh, yes. Is the is the is the recovery just aesthetic or does it recover also the functions of the organs? Okay, this is a very specific. Um, but uh, uh, scores are uh, quite high also in functionality and in, uh, there's good um, scores, but it's uh, something that is still studied and um, so that's why it's, um, I mean, it's very new and there's new studies now um, just uh, for, uh, have, um, Measuring a, a follow-up uh, of this um, uh, surgical technique, but uh, if you read at um, article of uh, um, Foldes, uh, you will see that it's not purely aesthetic um, uh, surgery. It's uh, at uh, at the beginning. It's the um, yes, it's um, it's um, um, it aims to restore the the organ and the anatomy of the clitoris. So I will not uh, describe now the, the, sur the, sur the sur surgical technique itself, but um, it's actually aesthetically, it's, uh, sometimes it's not so good to see. It's uh, also subject to debate, also this aspect. So um, yes, it's, uh, the, the, per the, pr the principal purpose is uh, function functional. Yeah, I agree with that. The, the basic um, aim is the function, to restore the function. But I've heard surgeons saying to um, women, many women saying that it depends on the initial cut and it depends on the initial damage, obviously. If you have um, the sensitive part damaged completely, then well, the argument is no matter what, how re you try to reconstruct it, and you might not be able to bring the full functions back. Again, there's that um, argument that people have said uh, many times, and again, it depends on who performed the um, FGM, as we all know. So again, it depends on the initial damage. Okay, thank you. There was one reaction here from Adriana. Thank you, I'm an old lady, 30 years old, so 
sorry. Last one, and it will be short. Um, I think that we need to think that when we're talking about sexuality, we are not talking about genitality. And please, please, we need to, to think that there is a mind, that there is an experience, there is a landscape in life of the relations we did have, the partners we did have, the time when we had these sexual relations. So don't reduce things to genitality because we'll go the wrong way. I think that is very important, which Comfort was saying that, you know, you need to be very honest and say it might work, it might not work physically, okay? And that's why WHO did not take any position on reconstruction at the moment because it's not clear. So please, 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 uh, when we talk about this, let's think in terms of sexuality because women might be reconstructed and they might have this, you know, little thing, nice little thing that we have but the scar is here, okay? So we need more support in terms of psychological um, counseling with these women, and not only reconstruction, physical, physical. We need mental, yes. mental reconstruction, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I would just like myself to make a small comment. As you can see yesterday, we spoke mostly of uh, specific uh, socio-political contexts, social organization, and how society lives, FGM. And today, because we are talking about mostly about uh, European context, we are focusing on the victims, on their sexuality, on their genitalia. So I think these two uh, focus from our African uh, speakers and from our speakers here in Europe also shows how FGM is also differently taken into consideration in the different contexts. I don't know if you have remarked the, the slightly change in, in the topics, but it, it has been one, maybe except for uh, O, that presents us also with uh, something from Sierra Leone and how society is uh, coping with FGM. Uh, but I would ju just make this final remark. Thank you, have some lunch over there as yesterday, so welcome you. Thank you.